Hello, everyone. Welcome to the fourth season of Stories to Share. My name is Joe Steinfield. I am the moderator of this series, and this is a dazzling turnout. How many of you are here for the first time? Excellent. As you can see, we have a sterling lineup of speakers. So when you get home, you can just mark your calendars the first Friday of the month. Each month, up to and including June, nine speakers who will be sharing their stories with us. I want first to acknowledge and thank our sponsors, whose names appear at the bottom, the Savings Bank of Walpole, our exclusive platinum sponsor. I think that means they gave more, but I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, Beltetz and the Monadnock Ledger Transcript. We do not charge for you to come. We do not pay the speakers who volunteer their time. But nonetheless, there are some expenses. And one of those this year is, for those who've been here before, a different audio visual setup, some new equipment. And let me introduce Violet Shuttler in the back, who is, who, well, hold your applause. Hold your applause. She is a graduate of Franklin Pierce with a degree in digital media. She holds a position at Franklin Pierce as a producer and technician. And we are very fortunate that she has agreed to be part of our team. Next, let me introduce Sean Driscoll, who has been with us from the beginning and who will be a co-moderator and very active in this year's speaker series. David Beltet is the president of the Jaffrey Civic Center, and Laura Adams is the executive director. So that's the team, and uh, I appreciate all of the efforts. By the way, after today's uh, stories are done. Please stay for the reception, for which we thank Jean Duval and Nancy Beltet, who handle our receptions after each speaker. Thanks also to for former speakers and, and this year's speakers, who are in the front and in the back, and uh, I will introduce them, or Sean will introduce them uh, when their time comes. So we turn to, oh, you're supposed to say this. Please, turn off your phones, if you haven't already. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Eleanor Briggs. Many of you know her. She is a photographer. She is a conservationist, and she is a philanthropist. Last year, some of you were here for Susie Spickle from the Harris Center. Eleanor is the founder of the Harris Center, and I expect we'll hear a little bit today about how that came to be. She has traveled everywhere where wildlife still flourishes. Southeast Asia, India, Latin America, and probably other continents that I have forgotten to mention. Her point in going to these places is to promote conservation efforts of the Wildlife Conservation Society and other organizations using her very sharp eye and her photographer's lens to preserve much of what she sees 
and we'll be seeing what she's done today. She's off, I think it's next month to Cambodia, next spring Guatemala, and on and on. There's nobody that I would rather have as our first speaker this year for stories to share. Please welcome Eleanor Briggs. Joe, thank you so much for that introduction. And what a turnout. Thank you. Good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're thinking. Um, and thank you for turning off the lights. We're going to start our adventure. Let's see. So here I am with Lisa, a baby giant anteater that was orphaned uh, in, in um, Bolivia and required huge care in order to grow up and just as adorable as a strife toy. So um, you might ask, how did all this begin? In my childhood, of course, doesn't it always? Uh, as a child, I summered in Hancock and it was kind of lonely. Uh, my father and my grandmother were my companions. So I roamed the woods and was comforted by the trees and the sparkling leaves and the fuzzy moss cushions. And here I am in the terrible uh, quality photograph, but it's 75 years old. And um, I'm in the swimming pool at the Harris Center, which later became the pollinator garden. And that's that little black speck in my hand is a frog. So always uh, interested in nature. Fast forward to the 60s when um, there was great anxiety over the environment. The environment was a new word at that time. Rachel Carson had written Silent Spring and I'd lost my Long Island nature sanctuary. I'd grown up in this little harbor that had swans, geese, ducks, horseshoe crabs, flounders, clams, and this little paradise had been paved over. It was only 43 miles from New York City. So I feared for my other sanctuary in Hancock. So there I was, there's the Harris Center back in the day. So um, I noticed that people who were born around here didn't seem to value the natural beauty around us. They wanted more banks, bigger supermarkets, and more conveniences, but they hadn't seen what development can do. Late in the 60s, my father sold my grandmother's place to a developer, and I was in a position to buy it all back, piece by piece. The developer made a fortune on us. <laughs> but what to do with this lovely white elephant, which was seen here, um, uninsulated with a, a staff quarters for 10 people. Um, it seemed like in this situation, education was the answer. Because I thought if we could all get to know where we live, then we might fall in love with it and really want to protect this very special part of our planet. I asked a retired diplomat and neighbor, Cecil Lyon. This is our 10th uh, birthday. It actually shows um, John Coolish, our first uh, staff person. He um, was, grew up in the woods, kind of, and spent most of his time there and knew more about nature and plants and animals than anybody I'd ever met. Here's David Blair, who worked for us and is sitting here today. And Mead Cadeau was our first real director. This is Cecil Lyon, uh, a retired diplomat and wonderful neighbor who became the Harris Center's first, I asked him to become the Harris Center's first director. And for the first five years, we ran it together. We had talks by Adele Davis, the nutrition guru, and Margaret Mead, the anthropologist, and a thousand people would show up 
So they, they heard these people in the Conval gym, which had horrible acoustics, as you can imagine. Um, Margaret Mead uh, asked for $5,000 as a speaking fee. And Cecil told her that we weren't that kind of foundation. <laughs> <laughs> we were the kind of foundation that looked for money to raise money rather than giving it out. So she said, change your name. And so the Harris Foundation was born, the Harris Center for Conservation Education. And Harris, oh, there's John Coolish with his trout. And here's Harris. Uh, <laughs> it was named after my cat, who was a magnificent cat. And Harris morphed into a... Um, a bobcat, because you really can't have a domestic cat as a, an environmental center. Uh, they were responsible for millions of dead birds every year. Anyway, not Harris. <laughs> but so anyway, so we, uh, Dr. Mead Cadeau um, expanded the Harris Center, seen here walking with some people. Um, in, he developed a land protection program, which is now at 35,000 acres today, and expanded work in our schools, uh, now 33 schools of the Monadnock region. And eventually, the Harris Center became a private operating foundation. Um, went, uh, sorry, went from a private operating foundation, funded primarily by me, to a public charity supported by all of us. And I headed the board for 18 years during that time, and the, in the 36 years since, the Harris Center has expanded its programs in land protection, outings, citizen science, and weekend events. Like that, all those woods, the, the woods that were so um, treasured by me have become uh, trails for all of us. And Here's, here's the pollinator in, the, uh, in what used to be the swimming pool. It wasn't a very good swimming pool. It was cold. And, and I always cut my knee on the rocks <laughs> inside. Anyway, so um, the Harris Center has expanded in a lot of ways, but it has not expanded its geographical footprint. It continues to serve the 33 schools of the Monadnock region. I've seen organizations, big and small, over the years, expand and dilute their impact. Uh, one that has not diluted anything is the Wildlife Conservation Society. After photographing for the International Crane Foundation for about 10 years, I started volunteering for WCS. It's headquartered at the Bronx Zoo and has over 60 programs around the world programs of two years, four years, 10 years, 20 years. And so now I'd like to take you on a quick tour of some experiences which I found inspiring and revealing in just a few of the countries that I was in. And here we are in Cambodia. <laughs> <laughs> Cambodia has been through a lot. Uh, the Vietnam War, as you used to fly into Phnom Penh, you'd see crater marks from the Vietnam War. And these crater marks were converted into uh, fish ponds by the Cambodians. They're always very, very clever about uh, using what's there. Then, of course, uh, came the Khmer Rouge horrors next from 1975 to 1979. During that time, two million people of the population of five million were killed or died of starvation and disease. It's a fascinating country that has prodigious um, natural heritage. It's got, uh, for instance, the Great Lake. There's the Great Lake, which is right there in the center, uh, and a, a remarkable um, piece of water, the largest lake in Southeast Asia. And I lived there for three months in 1997 in one of the floating villages, uh, working to protect the eggs and chicks of the largest water bird colony in Southeast Asia. Also, it, Cambodia has beautiful um, uh, ruins. So the, uh, the floating village is just like any other village, except that 
the streets are water and the cars are boats. And there are 7-Elevens there. Um, people don't have closets. Uh, the America has made a slight presence. Uh, there are dress shops and boat repair stores, very important. All these things in, in this floating village. And people raise crocodiles for the skins. They send the babies to, uh, to China to be raised. And there's, of course, a monastery. And the monks go around and have a good time in the boats. And children play, just like any other village. This is a 12th century bar relief from the Bayon Temple at Angkor. Uh, it's an ir actually a wildlife survey. At the bottom, you see the deer and the cranes and different birds. And then notice the fish, so many fish. Uh, Cambodia was once the largest freshwater fishery uh, in the world. Um, and much of the fish gets processed in Prechtal this floating village that I lived in. It gets weighed, processed by everybody, including children. And there's a lot of money involved. So going out of the village into the flooded forest, um, trees here uh, depend not on how much drought they can take, but on how much drowning they can take. <clears throat> this is the wet season when the lake expands to twice its size, what, twice its dry season size. It's really beautiful with the blossoms in the water. As the water recedes, and people go around very easily, so as the water recedes, uh, the largest water bird colony in Southeast Asia kicks into gear. The sun rises, the birds start to move. <coughs> Open bill stork colonies, cormorants, ibis, 11 threatened or endangered species of water birds, which made this uh, these are greater adjutant storks. They're cannibals. They eat baby chicks of other species, the cormorants. <coughs> and all of this made um, th this water, this great colony, a Ramsar site and bio biosphere reserve, thanks to the efforts that began in 1997. <coughs> Rangers patrol. Um, to prevent the collection of eggs and chicks from the colony. And um, also, they, they live on these platforms out in the, in the uh, flooded forest. They can live there for like five or 10 days fishing, and then they cook rice. And that's really all Cambodians need is fish and rice. And they, the uh, rangers also um, conduct formal bird and nesting counts, creating hard data for the researchers. And school children visit. The next place that I want to show you is a reservoir a uh, reservoir dug in the 12th century. It's a, an Angkorian reservoir um, that was renovated in the 70s by the Khmer Rouge. Over 10,000 people died during this renovation. It's um, a great place for habitat for birds and fish. At the bottom, okay, at the bottom is just open water and then grassland, which the cranes love and then paddy field, and then the forest in the north. Um, uh, 
great habitat for birds and fish. These are um, whistling ducks. And people fishing, trapping the fish. Cambodians love fish. And um, the water lilies also provide a uh, livelihood for people. The, they're brought to the cities and uh, sold not for the blossoms, but for the stems, which are used in, in soup. It's very delicious. So in the 90s, uh, Sam Visna, Cambodia's first conservationist, was always exploring uh, looking for Cambodian wildlife and um, asking local people about it and also um, hoping to get young people interested in it. And in 1998, he took me and some wildlife officials to Antrepang Tamal, this reservoir, to uh, look for cranes. So we'd been warned that the Khmer Rouge had an encampment north of the reservoir. So we went out in the boat with the police. And I counted 180 cranes, and Visna counted 200. It was phenomenal. And then a shot rang out, and the police made us go back to shore. Here are the cranes in the distance. They're just So um, that night, um, we spent the night at right next to a police station. And Sabanari, one of the wildlife officials, the government officials, had packed her bags, and she was ready to spend the night on the ground floor right next to the truck. And I said, Sabanari, why are you doing that? Because nobody sleeps on the ground floor out in the country. They're, the pigs are roaming around, and there's snakes and other things. And so she said, well, while we're asleep, the Khmer Rouge are going to come and kill us. And I said, no, they're going to hear about us tonight, and they will come tomorrow. <laughs> and so we will be long gone. And so we slept up above in, in the, on the second floor. And um, so I convinced everybody to do this. And so we went to sleep on mats with sleep with um, mosquito nets. And during the night, I had a dream. And I saw in my dream two man's feet at the bottom of my mat, and I knew it was a Khmer Rouge. And I didn't know what to do, so I grabbed them and bit as hard as I could. <laughs> and my teeth were waggling, and nothing happened. He didn't flinch, so I screamed, and everybody woke up. <laughs> and the next morning, we left at dawn, <laughs> safe. <laughs> Visna submitted this report um, on the Eld's deer on the cranes and the elves deer, which were also um, there. But here, here's some saurus cranes, beautiful creatures that wintered uh, in this reserve. And they were also elves deer, which are quite rare as well. And so this was a really um, valuable uh, reserve. And so Visna met with provincial officials, and um, eventually um, I met with our US ambassador, Kenneth Quinn, who wanted to be known as the Green Ambassador. So he really liked the idea of Antrepang Tamal becoming a um, nature reserve. And at that time, Hun Sen, the prime minister, had killed a few people, and he needed some good PR, some whitewash. And so he decided to declare here, seen here in Khmer, uh, he decided to declare the um, crane reserve a uh, crane protected area. So it was very exciting. Uh, we had, and after the peace, the Khmer Rouge, unfortunately, settled 
uh, with General Promsu, seen here, the um, man with one arm. He settled his troops um, to the north of the reserve, in, within the reserve, to the north of the, of the reservoir. And, um, and the soldiers cut the trees, built houses, and they went hunting in the reserve. So the deputy governor, the deputy district governor, um, called people together and had a meeting to try to establish rules uh, and explain why it was so important to respect wildlife. In other words, no hunting, and would they please control their dogs? Because every, every family has one or two dogs. Um, and I, meanwhile, talked to the police. So um, WCS uh, became a, established a country program in Cambodia in 1999, convinced by our research, and created this headquarters for researchers and patrol teams. Here's one of the patrol teams that would go out and um, make sure that there was no hunting and um, the trees were not being girdled, which they were often. So uh, unfortunately, tragically, in 1999, December of 1999, Samvisna died of falciparum malaria. He was chasing a report of the probably extinct cupre or wild cattle. Uh, and he'd been given counterfeit malaria, uh, counterfeit drugs. Um, the real drugs had been sold and be replaced with chalk pellets. So it was, it's one of the things that happened in Cambodia a lot back then. Um, so they lost, Cambodia lost their first conservationist. In response, uh, WCS formed the Samvisna Center which highlights the country's birds and uh, has guides which take groups from around the world with big success. So as the sun sets on ATT, we go to dawn in the northern plains and the giant ibis. This bird was thought to have been extinct, um, had not been seen since the 60s, when in 1994, a researcher was flying an aerial survey and thought he saw a giant ibis, but people didn't believe him, really. So we got on the ground and chased after these birds <laughs> in, at dawn. It's very comical, trying to locate them, and establish that about 200 exist. So it was very exciting to discover this, rediscover this bird. So in order to help the population and protect the, um, the nesting birds, the Ibis Rice Project was created. And in this project, farmers agree to guard the giant Ibis nests and plant high quality rice using no chemicals. WCS buys the rice for 10% above the market price and packages it and sells it. Here they are working with the farmers and working on the amount of money, packages it and sells it. Um, this is some of the advertising campaign. To, um, to Germany, the UK, Canada, and Hong Kong. So it's, it's become very successful. And tourists, of course, also come to see these birds and other birds. Uh, and so WCS started the Tamat Bowie Com Community Lodge to benefit the neighboring village, but without introducing foreign culture into the village itself. The, the lodge is at a distance uh, from the village. Um, so foreigners can stay in comfort within the giant ibis and white-shouldered ibis habitat. Northeast Cambodia also has beautiful forests, and Keo Sema uh, is a wildlife sanctuary and national park 
that was um, created by WCS, 11,000 square miles of it. And it's the site of a RED project, R-E-D-D. -D. It's a UN project for carbon sequestration where you can sell carbon credits. And it's brought in over $3 million so far in revenue to the area, which is a tremendous boon. It also has elephants, gibbons, and birds, and, um, and enormous trees. But there's a lot of illegal logging of what is called lo uh, luxury woods, uh, very huge, valuable trees. And um, it's these huge trees. And it's very dangerous uh, to be on patrol to protect this place. Um, Quite a few, not quite a few, but three have the uh, rangers were murdered. Um, and these uh, boards find their way into people's houses and then they sell them. This is a, um, a small ranger station that was uh, developed by um, WCS for the um, police. And some of the, the patrol some of the confiscated uh, homemade guns and chainsaws and on patrol, on foot or on, in mo on motorcycles. It's, it's really hard, hot work. And, and logs leave even on bicycles, pieces of logs. This is a, a car being stopped because it was suspiciously low to the ground. And I'm going to show you how, how you pack a car with logs. So if, in case you want to bring your logs home from <laughs> someplace, <laughs> this, is, this is how they do it. And even logging trucks were were confiscated. More chainsaws. And more logs and motorcycles, more motorcycles, all confiscated. And cars, all confiscated. All to prevent this, this deforestation. The forests are beautiful. And they um, provide places for the community to have a good time and also uh, a livelihood for um, people can tap the resin trees and they, they set fire, they make a hole and set fire in the hole and, uh, and then put, it, put the fire out with green uh, leaves. And a tree can last for over 100 years without dying and still giving resin for, um, to waterproof um, boats and, and other uses too, I'm sure. So Cambodia is developing and uh, the pressure is enormous. Phnom Penh real estate is just skyrocketing in value. At the end of every Cambodian visit, this is what greets me. It's a dinner put on by my friend Chamnan and his family. And I'm expected to eat most of this. <laughs> Otherwise, I would be very rude. So I, I try to starve myself for a few days <laughs> before these things. <laughs> So we leave Cambodia and come to briefly to Myanmar uh, because I just wanted to show you this example of a dramatic example of a threat to the country's environment. This is a Chinese gold mine and the uh, massive deforestation and heavy use of water um, in the process of getting the gold. And then in the final stages of gold refinement, um, mercury is used. And that pollutes whole river systems. Uh, and the fish become 
dangerous to eat. Um, and they're often the only protein that people have available to them. So now we're going to leave Myanmar and go to India. So uh, this is a national park called Nagarhole with huge trees. Nagarhole is 248 square miles of protected habitat in a country of 1.4 billion people. So it's really quite amazing that they managed to carve out 248 square miles of habitat. It includes huge trees and wonderful water and wildlife. Can you see it? Yeah. Chitao, beautiful spotted deer, sambar, bigger deer, and biggest, gaur, these huge 2,000 pounders. Langurs, wild pigs, and peacocks. Beautiful peacocks. And of course, elephants. So everything except for the elephants are all prey for tigers. And the tigers were being hunted by um, 34,000 inhabitants of the park. These were 125 villagers, villages in the forest. And Dr. Ulas Karant, seen here, Ulas is on the left, um, was working with WCS and assessed the prey and the tiger situation and managed to very carefully relocate, this is him, setting up a camera trap. And there's, there's uh, looking at tiger marks, the claw marks on a tree where the tiger has sent marked. They, Ulas has carefully uh, relocated, managed the relocation with the government of um, almost all of the people who lived within the forest. And um, this has resulted in over 100 tigers today in Nagarhole. These people who were relocated were given tractors and land, which they could cultivate, which they never had within Nagarhole. And uh, schools, water, uh, pure uh, drinkable water. And these wonderful, wonderful people. I'm very happy. So now, uh, we leave India, and I want to show you a last, the last country is Bolivia. Uh, it has a completely different approach to conservation from India. It's a country of 11 million people. So you can see the difference between 11 million and 1.4 billion. So here in the Altiplano, at 10 to 15,000 feet, um, the population is very sparse. And people don't negatively impact wildlife. So they, they are quite happily uh, living in, in Madidi National Park with their animals. WCS, they're mostly herders of alpaca, llamas, sheep, and a few cattle. Um, it's critical to keep the people's uh, animals healthy because they're um, living in a subsistence um, level just on the edge, and the death of even one animal is a disaster for the family and might force them to start hunting wildlife. So WCS offers veterinary services and uh, professional backup in La Paz. Do you see anybody familiar? 
sometimes that costume weighs so much. It's a lot of fun sometimes. So also in the Andes, the Kaliawalia, who are in an indigenous group of traditional healers. They've been healers for over a thousand years from pre-Incan times and were purported to be the first to use quinine to treat malaria. And they speak a secret language. At the beginning of any project, um, one wants to have a Kaliawalia tabla blanca, which is this ceremony involving coca leaves and llama wool and uh, llama fetuses and um, carnation flowers, among other things. And then, after creating the Tabla Blanca, it gets wrapped up and burned. And this is it. So, thank you very much. I, I wanted to say that there is great success, actually, th thanks to the Kaliawalia and WCS and the Harris Center. Um, next month, I go to Cambodia to celebrate uh, the 25th anniversary of WCS in Cambodia. It's one of their largest programs and very successful. And locally, the Harris Center is expanding uh, with their open lodge, which is going to accommodate 250 of us, as opposed to the Babbitt Room, which was we were popping out of it at 100. So it's I've distributed a few brochures around. If you want more, you could see Susie Spickle or myself after the program. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well. <laughs> well, would anyone here like to see and hear it again? <laughs> no, no. You can do so on YouTube, and you can tell your friends and relatives, total strangers, uh, sometime next week while I live, am I correct? So if you go on YouTube and find Jaffe Civic Center, we can all once again, experience this remarkable, amazing presentation. And how many slides did we just see? Um, 198, was it? Uh, 224. Oh, 224, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> My son helped me so much with this PowerPoint. So who took all those pictures? I did. I thought so. <laughs> Except that. Right. Well, Eleanor, thank you so much. We yes. do have some time. Uh, who would like to ask a question? A question. Hi, Eleanor. What's Hi. happening in this picture? In this picture? It's a controlled burn, and I love fire, so I always get involved. <laughs> Yes, over here. That, that was your question. Okay. So, what are the top three priorities of WCS now? Um, it's uh, intact forests because uh, many of the forests that have not only um, or have not been logged, but they also have the birds and the animals. That's the definition of. The, which has a complete uh, a complete uh, suite of creatures. And um, many of these forests are not protected. Um, a lot of money is going to uh, protecting and restoring degraded forests, which takes a lot more money when there's a whole bunch of forest out there that needs protection now before it gets degraded. So that's, that's one of the things. And, um, oh, God, I'm... I think that's that's the latest. 
Who's next? Yes, uh, David. Can you talk about the risk? I'm sorry. Can you talk about the rhythm of going out and coming home? The which? The rhythm, the balance of rhythm of going of leaving and returning. Um, well, leaving often to Southeast Asia is a 12-hour uh, time difference, so that takes a couple of days to adjust to, uh, and then it's very exciting to have people who's who will meet your eyes as opposed to some people in this country. And, um, and then coming home, uh, it's wonderful to be cool again. <laughs> and, or it used to be. And, um, and it's, I don't know what to say about that. Maybe you should, you should say more. It sounds like you balance both. Each, you love going out and you love coming back. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes, because people ask me, you know, when I'm away, often in these countries, they say, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would you live? And I say, I'm living there, yeah. you know? And they, they say, what? <laughs> I'm so rooted in New Hampshire, it's embarrassing. <laughs> the question from this gentleman, uh, I should tell you all, he is a speaker this year, David Blair, who many of you know as the founder of the Mariposa Museum, <laughs> speaking of world travel. Uh, I have a question, one of the rest of you pick up questions. It has to do with the safety, danger component of your various travels. Well, only in Laos and, and Cambodia did I feel in danger with the, uh, the mines. One time a, um, I was in a village and the uh, village chief invited me to go to the next village with him. And as we were walking, he said, this is a garden of mines, follow me. So I followed him step by step. And, um, and then the Khmer Rouge were very unpredictable before 97. But mostly I feel safer over there than I do in this country. Well, that speaks well of them and not so well of us. Yes, questions? Helena, do you count birds? No, I personally don't. <laughs> it seems you'd have a tremendous list if you did. Oh, oh, no, 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 I'm not a lister. I, 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 I sort of, um, no, I, I just enjoy birds when I see them. I'm interested in how you support the Harris Center financially and uh, what would you like us to do to help support it? The question is, <laughs> would you like to make a pitch for the Harris Center? Definitely. Um, I, it, I think it's, we didn't at the beginning do a baseline survey. So I can't say these are our accomplishments um, as far as changing people's attitudes. And, but I think that we did. And um, I would uh, advise you all to give money to the Harris Center <laughs> and go as often as possible to their programs and, and uh, participate in this citizen science and their um, uh, courses as well that are wonderful. What can you say about what you've seen with climate change in your travels? Uh, well, the, the whole thing about uh, the, the um, Great Lake in Cambodia and the floating villages and uh, the water bird colonies, that whole ecosystem has been almost destroyed by climate change. Uh, and also the, the, the Chinese put nine dams on the mainstream of the, Me of the Mekong River uh, up in China, that did not help. Um, and it kind of stopped the, the flood recession um, aspect of, of the water, but the, um, the droughts and the rains have been unpredictable and strange. So that's, that's the main climate change that I've seen. And then also scorching uh, temperatures that I 
astutely avoid um, and, um, and way too much rain when it happens. The extremes like we're exp uh, experiencing. Yeah. Um, so were you part of this discovery of the bird, the big ibis? Like the guy thought he saw it, like we were on the ground every day, like let's find the bird. I mean, that's amazing. Well, the question is whether Eleanor helped discover the not extinct bird. Yeah, I, I didn't really, but I... I did. <laughs> I mean, for 30 years, that's remarkable. So then you see it and suddenly it shows up. Yeah, and then I was part of the team that chased after them. But uh, where I was discovering things was I was the first non-Cambodian into the uh, flooded forest after, um, after the Khmer Rouge regime. Because people would go, Cambodians would go into the flooded forest to collect eggs and chicks to celebrate their new year, which is in mid-April. And um, they were decimating the, the colonies. And so I uh, spent three months there to, to stop that from happening. And, um, and then keeping it stopped was another thing. But in the process of stopping it, I would go into the, into the flooded forest and People would wait for me outside. I'd go in with one boat and this, these two guys, and we spend the night in there. And um, and people would wait. And the people waiting, we would always buy them cigarettes and um, sweets. And we so when we would go to a, one of the floating stores and buy cigarettes and sweets, they'd say, "Oh, you're going out again, are you?" Yeah. <laughs> And the police would politely wait, you know, two miles away, three miles away. <laughs> Where haven't you gone that you'd like to go to? Oh, golly. Um, oh, that's a hard question. I can't answer it. <laughs> well, you go back to Cambodia. Yes. And, and, you I... go, and you're going back to Guatemala. And after that? I'd love to go back to Calcutta. That's one of my, my second favorite village, in, I mean, uh, city in the world. So After Hancock. <laughs> After Paris. <laughs> yes. Um, it's the fact that you might feel a little bit safer there than here, which I thought was interesting. Is there a certain way in which people communicate their come together, express themselves or express amongst each other in a group that is different than you find us to be? Oh, com many, many different ways. But um, one of the ways, since I don't often speak the language of these places, I usually with I contact, I ask if it's okay to photograph somebody or whatever. And, um, and they, people are not shy about looking at each other. I have an apartment in New York City, which has a little tiny elevator about twice as big as this. And sometimes when young people come into the elevator, they panic because there's another person in there and they spend their time like on their cell phone, nose to the cell phone until they can get out because I think we're kind of afraid of contact with each other. There's so many automated things like um, in the supermarkets or getting gas or we have and, um, banking. You know, we have less, less uh, contact with each other. And in some of these developing countries, people really, um, they're very comfortable with each other. But in, in Asia, you know, they never say no. You can, you can say, um, you know, is it raining when it's, the sun is out? And they'll say, yes, yes. You know, if you, if you think so, you know. It's impossible to, to get a, a direct answer from many of the Southeast Asian peoples. Well, uh, <clears throat> this has been quite an hour, Eleanor. I cannot thank you enough on behalf of Stories to Share. And now David Beltet, the president of the Jaffe Civic Center. Hello, everyone. 
I'm so glad you enjoy fire. Two gifts that are related. <laughs> <laughs> Important to Jaffrey, uh, fireworks, uh, oh. matches, things like that. But uh, I, I'll put <laughs> one right of my here. favorite things. Fireworks? Uh, yeah. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> As some of my friends know, I'm a fireworks addict. Oh, if I had known, I would Complete pyro. Um, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. I'd also like, on behalf of the trustees and myself, I'd also like to say tomorrow we have an opening here of a, a photo e exhibit by uh, Ethan Abbott. And upstairs, we have our uh, autumn program exhibit going on. So welcome. Please, please feel free. We have refreshments in the back following. And feel free to linger around the building and the patio. And you're, you're welcome. So thank you very much for coming. And what? And down to, oh, yes. And downstairs is open. We have uh, a collection of cog birds. Uh, that we uh, work, Warfield, Warfield yeah. <laughs> and uh, and there's some wonderful examples of them in our uh, 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 room on the side where we the fresh So please, please take a moment and walk around. And, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for sitting through this.